I'd like to make a, a short recapitulation of what we have discussed so far, just to put it into the right perspective again, to see how it is step after step instruction. It starts out with the king wanting peace of mind. Well, that's familiar to us. Whether we are kings or queens or not, we want peace of mind. And so he wants to find the right teacher. Well, that's familiar too, isn't it? But he has tried already quite a number of them. Those that were easily available happened to live around there. And uh, none of them were satisfactory for his quest because five of them said, in one way or another, that karma didn't have any resultants, that it didn't matter what one did. Some said it because it was, they believed in fate and destiny. Others said it because there was no cause and effect. And one was um, what is sometimes called the ill riddler. He said, if it's this way, I'll say it this way, and if it's that way, I'll say another way. And now the king himself knew already that karma did have results, because he had been often very a disturbed mind ever since he had killed his father and hadn't been able to sleep. So he knew already that these teachers were wrong from his own experience. One of them... Uh, only spoke about moral conduct. That was Mahavira, the uh, founder of the Jain sect. So he wasn't satisfied with any of them. And then he, the Buddha was recommended to him. So he went there. And then he asked him what was the fruit of the spiritual life. So the Buddha explained the fruit of the spiritual life gradually becoming more and more profound. So in the beginning, the first thing that he says about the fruit of the spiritual life is that if you do that as um, your main occupation in life, you're independent. Independent of the, of a boss, the king was the boss of many people. You don't have to listen to the boss. You become independent of the marketplace. In other words, because there's hardly any income, you don't have to pay taxes. And you have a much freer life. So he's giving him the examples of the slave that becomes a monk and then the um, workman that becomes a monk whom the uh, king would then support rather than telling them what to do. And then about the householder who becomes a monk and uh, takes out the spiritual life in all seriousness and lives according to a more refined moral conduct. And there was quite a long section about the refinement of moral conduct going further than just the five precepts as we usually hear them, further than not killing, not stealing, no sexual misconduct, no um, uh, wrong speech and no drugs or alcohol, but it goes into much more detail. And so that is a fruit because there's no remorse, no regret, and there's a feeling of inner strength. The inner strength comes from the experience of overcoming one's instincts and impulses. All human beings have the same instincts and the same impulses. They're all directed from greed and hate. But overcoming them, knowing that one can, and overcoming them again and again 
gives a feeling of great inner strength that oneself is reliable. One can rely on oneself, on oneself. And that makes one feel secure. So there's no remorse, no regret, no shame, no fear, because one knows one has acted in the best possible way. So these are the first fruits that can come. First, that independence from the um, authority of another, and then the moral conduct. And then the next thing that was mentioned was the calming of the senses. Not running after every pleasant sense contact that we make. In other words, not being so intent on sense pleasure. Now the very good result from that is that the mind is less disturbed. And we can very much um, relate to that here in this uh, situation, in the retreat situation, because our senses are not as often disturbed as they usually are outside, it's much easier to become calm and concentrated. I always compare our sense contacts with a lake into which a child is throwing stones and the stones make rings in the water. The stones which are being thrown into the lake are the sense contacts, seeing, hearing, tasting, touching, smelling, and thinking. And it takes time for those rings to flatten out again and for the surface of the lake to become calm. But in daily life, we don't give that any opportunity at all because there's one sense contact after another. So that's never calmed down, or hardly ever, in our daily activities. But there's one impact after another. So if we don't deliberately in life calm down with the senses, we will always find that the meditation is difficult in our, when we have ordinary activities. So again, it comes back down also to having the spiritual life as one's priority and taking the necessary steps to be able to remove oneself to whatever extent it is possible for one from the ordinary marketplace activities. Now that everybody has to do according to their own situation. There's no uh, hard and fast rule. And then the next thing, mindfulness and clear comprehension. So after the moral conduct comes the calming of the senses and then mindfulness and clear comprehension. Now obviously all of that is done voluntarily by a person because one has understood that only those steps will bring what one is looking for and what the king is looking for, peace. He's looking it for, for peace quite uh, openly. He says it. He uh, couldn't sleep very well all these nights. And so he's having problems in, in the daytime, of course, too. So one takes up these steps voluntarily in order to calm the mind. Now, mindfulness four foundations of mindfulness. First one, the body, watching the movement and the action. And there are so many that one has quite a lot to do with that. And then the second one, feeling, which includes, of course, sensation, but it's also emotion. And then the third one, the thinking, which has already embedded in it the kind of thinking we're doing. Are we doing a thinking which is um, <coughs> creating an unwholesome situation within us or a wholesome one? 
And then the fourth one, which is the content of the thought. And in that context, so far we've only considered the five hindrances. And there are more content of thought instructions by the Buddha, which we will um, discuss. But at this point, I'm going to leave it at the five hindrances, which we talked about as content of thought, which includes the opposite, seeing that they are not content of thought, seeing that the thought has no sensual desire, no ill will, no sloth and torpor, no worry and restlessness, no skeptical doubt. I mean, it would be much nicer if we found that. But if we do find the other, naturally, that's when some action, mind action, is necessary. And then, clear comprehension. And clear comprehension in the context of a very intensive meditation activity. In daily life, the four parts of clear comprehension, purpose, skillful means, within the Dhamma has the purpose been accomplished. But in the context of the retreat, in a far more profound way, the purpose to be directed towards the three characteristics, Anicca, Dukkha, Anatta. I think I don't have to translate those three words anymore, do I? I mean, we've heard them that often, probably coming out of our ears. That's all right. They're supposed to go into our hearts, so. (laughs) As a purpose. Is the purpose I'm pursuing at this time directed towards the understanding of any of those three? And again, I'd like to say that it's uh, quite valuable to pick the one that one is most interested in. The more the mind is interested in what it's doing, the better it can do it. If we read a book which we find utterly tedious and boring, it will stand to reason that we won't remember a word of it. In fact, we probably don't even remember the sentence we've just read. But if we're fascinated and interested by the book, we will then go out and tell the, the content of it to whoever is willing to listen, because we remember. The more we are interested in what we are doing, the better we will do it. The uh, suitability is the second one, which is the same as skillful means. Is it suitable what I am doing towards that purpose? And then the third one, the resort. Not to go away without it. The resort being mindfulness. Not to leave the meditation cushion and leaving the mindfulness behind or taking it with one but losing it out there somewhere and not bringing it back but having it with one as one's most valuable companion the one that will really help us to see things the way they really are that's a word by the Buddha Yata Bhutanyana Dasana seeing the knowledge and vision of things as they really are. That's what we're after. When we have that, we are on the verge of gaining access to the non-delusion. Now, delusion is the underlying factor for every problem there is. It doesn't matter what the problem is called. That has no bearing on it. And the fourth aspect of clear comprehension in the context of a meditation retreat is the clear comprehension of non-delusion. This clear comprehension of non-delusion has several aspects. They all lead in the direction 
all of the methods lead in the direction of losing this me delusion of becoming clear in the mind how things really are so it is no longer have I actually achieved my purpose but using methods in order to achieve the purpose which was the first step of clear comprehension, namely to see Anicca, Dukkha, Anatta, either one of them. So now the fourth one, the clear comprehension of non-delusion, is the method of getting to that purpose. Is that clear? I see some uh, faces which look a bit uh, surprised. Any, anything not clear? It's all right, is it? Okay. Um, now, for instance, there's one aspect which is sort of like the thread that goes through the whole thing, and that is using the methods which we have already discussed. In everything that we do outside of meditation, but also as meditation subjects. Becoming aware of elements, becoming aware of the aggregate, becoming aware of the sense basis. I have talked about the four elements already, but here's another guideline. How to become aware of them through mindfulness on the body, for instance, in walking meditation or in just walking. Now, when we are walking and we are mindful, we know that we are moving the feet. And that's all we know. The same in walking meditation. But there's another way of deepening that understanding. Because, all right, we're moving the feet and we know that. But now we can deepen that understanding by recognizing the four elements as they are part of the walking. When we raise the foot, the heat, the fire element, and the air element are predominant. Heat always rises to the top. So that is the fire element. And air element is movement. When there is air or wind, there is movement. And actually, as we raise the foot and bring it forward, we can feel that we are dispersing the, the air where we have the foot. So we have air and fire predominate for raising and going forward. Dropping the foot, water and earth element. Water is the heaviest thing there is. It's the heaviness of coming down. And earth is the contact of the solidity of the foot on the ground. Now these four elements will show us if we do it with some concentration that this body has no reason to be called me, none whatsoever. It's a mind aberration. It's nothing but a mind-made, self-made idea which constantly creates trouble. Because we are fearful that something should happen to this body or to bodies that we are attached to. And yet, when we get it really clear that there's nothing but those four elements operating, and it can be done in walking meditation, it can be done in walking, it can be done in the movement of the arm, it can be done in everything where movement is part, takes part, then we can also see that those four elements are all around us 
in the stones, in the uh, trees, in the bushes, in the house, in everybody else, all other people. And in that becomes very clear as a feeling. Love and compassion and joy with others is much, much easier. Because there's nobody else. It's just all part of the same manifestation of existence. The identification with the body eventually completely disappears. It's just a body. And it really doesn't make any difference so much what shape, form, age, color, and so forth it has. It's just a body. That doesn't mean that we neglect it. But we lose the identification and the intoxication with it. The intoxication with the body brings with it the desire and the strongest desire we have is called karma raga. It's not karma, but karma, K-E-M-A, raga. Raga is rage, raging, strong desire. That's sexual desire. That's the strongest one that is in existence in human beings, probably in animals the same. And with that understanding, and not only understanding, but that inner experience of the only four elements there and all the other stuff is also those same elements that eventually is diminished so that it's no more a nuisance it uh, disappears at the stage of non-return so it's a little bit along the path yet but it disappears it, it diminishes to the point where it's no problem. And that is part of the practice. Now, each step of this practice has to be taken somewhere along the line. They do not necessarily, in one's own practice, follow exactly this um, sequence. That doesn't always happen like that. Sometimes one has a different sequence in one's own practice. But they're all being taken somewhere along the line. This is the sequence which the Buddha gave and which is usually more or less the same sequence. From his own experience, one would imagine that this is what usually happens. But it doesn't have to. Sometimes one has something ahead which and then comes back later to this. But this is one part of using walking meditation in order to become aware of elements. There's something else, for instance, also to do with the body. When one lies down in bed, to become aware of the fact that the body and the bed touching earth elements. Body, no consciousness. Bed, no consciousness. Elements. Body has nerve endings, but consciousness is in mind. So, again, a lack of identification and intoxication with the body. It does not meant to lead, it doesn't mean to lead to disgust. It means it is meant to lead towards equanimity. Seeing things as they really are. Not having this identification process of this is me and I have to um, and this is the, the person that is separate from our other person. The elements give one a very good idea that there is no separation. One of the aspects that the Buddha constantly um, reiterated in order to come to non-delusion. Well, now, non-delusion is the same as wisdom or insight. It's the same thing. Um, sometimes it's called ignorance, delusion. Sometimes it's called 
delusion in or ignorance and uh, sometimes the opposite is called insight wisdom or non-delusion so they're all the same thing and they're always they mean only one thing they always mean that when we haven't reached non-delusion we still think of ourselves as a separate person me and we don't only think it we feel it because we've been thinking it for so long it's one thinking is one of our sense contacts all sense contacts bring feeling so think, seeing we've been thinking this for ever so long there's no reason why we shouldn't feel it but where we to now turn around and do the opposite there's no reason why we shouldn't feel the opposite so it does start with the understanding and as we understand it and repeat it repeatedly look into it in this way for instance as with the four elements eventually there's no way that we can get away from feeling it the thinking process brings feeling now of course every time we take that back and think oh no no it's me well then we feel differently again we feel me again so it is a matter of repetition doing it over and over again and being utterly convinced that that is the only way out of dukkha as long as we're looking for some other way we're always going to try something else how me could get some pleasure which will last the me that wants the pleasure is not the me that's going to look at the non-me so it's only it is absolutely essential for this um, practice to be successful is that the conviction is there that is what I want to do and that conviction comes from practicing the best uh, help we can get in the practice are the meditative options there's no doubt about it it's an automatic um, insight path it's, it's, a, it's tranquility but it brings automatic insight with it but even without that or even only partially that the practicing of watching the elements in this case again and again makes it quite clear so the other thing that helps towards this non-delusion which achieves the purpose or is working towards the purpose I should say of getting Anicca Dukkha not that clear is the checking up on the aggregate now we have five and one is the body so I will leave that out because we have all these other aspects of checking out on the body the four aggregates of mind and I have already mentioned it quite a number of times but I will mention it again because it is easy to forget and also sometimes not heard properly as a meditation method as a contemplation method it doesn't matter to become aware of the mind activity as it is constantly repeated again and again and again sense contact feeling perception mental formation the easiest sense contact to be aware of is the touch contact which is sitting here on the pillow the touch of one's buttocks on the pillow nobody can get away from it everybody's got it and this touch contact creates a feeling if we haven't sat very long maybe the feeling is neutral if we have sat long enough maybe the feeling is unpleasant whatever it is it is either pleasant unpleasant or neutral and then comes the perception which is the labeling and maybe say pain and then comes the mental formation which is the reaction which says I've got to move 
It may even say before that, without our noticing it, I don't like it or terrible, anything like that. Now, the mental formation, the sankara, is also called the karma formation because that's where we make karma. The sense contact does not make karma. The feeling does not make karma. The perception doesn't make karma. It's all automatic. It's the mental reaction, the mental formation, the sankara, which makes karma. The moment we react, we've made karma. If we react negatively, negative karma. Very simple. But, Because everything happens so quickly, usually, we have the great chance here in this retreat where everybody has now slowed down to actually become aware of sense contact, feeling, perception, all automatic, and then the reaction. And very often, in the beginning of this practice, one knows the reaction only. Then, after having been told often enough to look for all four, one knows the sense contact and the reaction. And then, having slowed down enough, one becomes aware of sense contact, perception, reaction. And only when one has really slowed down and is determined to get it, come to grips with this, does one know the feeling. It is so quick, everything. We are, the mind is so quick to react that very often we don't even know that we have felt something other than getting a painful feeling in the sitting position. That we know. But exactly the same thing happens with seeing, hearing, tasting, or smelling, and thinking. And it's a very interesting thing to become aware of because it is again knowledge and vision of things as they really are. Knowledge and vision means the understood experience. The vision is the experience, the knowledge is the understanding. The understood experience. We've all been having sense contact, feeling, perception and mental formation billions of times since we've been on this earth this time. But never have we had the understood experience until we start practicing. And then we can have it because the Buddha's explanation is there. It would never have occurred to us to look at it. So we see something we don't like, so we don't like it. Very simple, isn't it? But why don't we like it? And we hear something we don't like, so why? And are we going to keep on doing that? The reason we need to investigate this as one of the methods for non-delusion is that independent origination which is the wheel of samsara the wheel of birth and death it is exactly explained by the Buddha that the only doorway out transcending the world is in the non-reaction I don't want to go into the details of dependent origination because that's another month's course. But, (laughs) and I did that. (laughs) But it is important to know that factor. Dependent origination is often shown in a circular form and you may have seen those pictures somewhere. Um, It's now become a Tibetan art it, uh, it originated with the Buddha, but got lost in India and was taken over in Tibet. It's very often shown with a demon, which is holding a wheel, and then lots of little pictures in there. It starts out with ignorance, which is again another, the same thing, just another word for delusion. That's all it is. And it goes from, from that to karma making. Because the person who thinks he or she is I makes karma, good or bad, but making karma. 
and from that comes the rebirth consciousness from the rebirth consciousness comes the um, mind and body from that come the six senses and from the six senses comes the sense contact from the sense contact comes the feeling and from the feeling comes the reaction that's all shown on this picture and that is the doorway out feeling will be there but as long as we react to it with either wanting to have the pleasant or shunning the unpleasant so long we're going to have the whole wheel over and over again because after that after we've reacted already the next step is the craving which means wanting to have or wanting to get rid of then comes the clinging being attached to the pleasures, the comforts the nice things and from that comes then the becoming coming back here and then comes birth decay and death and then it says, the Buddha said and this is how all the Dukkha begins and ends so we have this whole um, wheel it's called the wheel of samsara the wheel of birth and death where we have one door to step out try it out in the in the context of a meditation which is much easier nothing very awful happens and nothing very um, desirable is there to be seen or to be uh, had so the sense contacts are there all the time and they should be there's no reason why they shouldn't be become aware of how it operates the sense contact how the other three follow and then see the mental reaction and then try if you can stop the mental reaction stop at the labeling and maybe not even the labeling just the contact but in order to gain freedom it's necessary to stop the reaction now that reaction is nothing other than wanting the pleasant and shunning the unpleasant that's all it is sometimes strongly and sometimes mildly so this is another method of dissecting ourselves and this is what the Buddha said in order to see things as they really are to dissect the compact now we look very compact don't we this body looks very compact one lump eh? and the mind well that also seems to be a lump it's constantly thinking and saying and talking and and doing something but it isn't it's all made up of parts and those parts need to be seen these are all different ways of getting at it and seeing we have a lot of time here and remarkable quiet I thought today no? <laughs> maybe somebody did said something um, it's the ideal time to get in there and dissect this lump which is called me because this lump which is called me we know that already has so many bits and pieces so let's get to know them and as we get to know them in the way of the Buddha we will eventually have an entirely different view of this me and as we get a different view of the me we can let go of the delusion and as we let go of the delusion we gain freedom and that's the whole reason for this exercise to gain freedom the sense basis is also a matter of um, investigation which I've already um, briefly included here when we look at these four mental aggregates, aggregates the first thing that we have is the sense contact 
So the sense contact must have a sense base. So we become aware, as we become aware of these aggregates, we also become aware of where this comes from. We have an, we have eyes, we have ears, we have the taste bud, we have a nose for smelling, we have the body for touching, and we have the mind for thinking. So these bases for the senses are also important to know because nobody identifies just with his or her pair of eyes or the two ears. And yet the mind reacts to it, to that contact that we make, as if this was all there was to me at that moment. This is mine. I've got to do something about it. I've heard something which I don't like, so I'm going to have to tell that person off which is a usual reaction. Or I see something that makes me feel very good, so I've got to have it. In other words, we identify with this happening as if this contact that we make was the only thing that there is. In in reality, it's nothing but our sense basis operating. This is another way of dissecting ourselves getting down into smaller details. The less we think of ourselves as a lump, the easier it is to let go. It's very difficult to let, go, to let go of this whole lump called me. I mean, it looks as if we're losing something. But if we realize that it's nothing but a pre-programmed uh, reaction that's happening and that this whole thing has cause and effect in it, then it is much easier to become free of it. So it's aggregates, sense spaces, and elements which are particularly recommended as meditation subjects and contemplation subjects for this fourth one of clear comprehension, which is non-delusion. And you can see from the difference here of clear comprehension, how much deeper that goes into the profundity of seeing things as they really are, rather than just using the superficial way of trying to make everyday life a little more harmonious. This goes into the depth. This, yesterday I called that, the Buddha's teaching is like surgery. And because it cuts out all the proliferation, all the externals, it cuts out all our views and opinions and it goes right down to the basic core, to what we really are. And when we see that and are able to concentrate in meditation, we'll be relieved that there's really Nobody there who's got to have any kind of perfection or performance. It's just all phenomena arising and ceasing. So with the, um, with those four aspects of clear comprehension added to mindfulness, our mindfulness in the times outside of meditation becomes a tool for insight. And that's what it should be. Because the Buddha said, it is for the purification of beings. Now I've already explained that, that the purification of beings comes through the mindfulness because we can't be mindful and negative at the same time. It's either one or the other. The same goes for our thinking process of purification of that through the four supreme efforts and the purification of our emotions through the four supreme emotions. But it goes further than just purification. It goes into the final elimination of all dukkha for entering the noble path for realizing Nibbana. 
Now realizing complete freedom through mindfulness means that we're using mindfulness as a tool for insight. So when my mindfulness therefore has to be used together with clear comprehension. And that clear comprehension in the way I have explained it is using the purpose, finding those three or one of those three characteristics in all that we contact. And then using those methods of non-delusion in order to get there. It's not helpful to only believe it. It's a nice first step. And having heard it often enough, one does get brainwashed into believing it. But it doesn't help. It can, it becomes just lip service. I've often heard it used that way. And the person hasn't changed at all. But experiencing it through using those methods, that changes one. And that changes one to the point where there is this feeling. As far as clear comprehension is concerned, it is mentioned in the commentary that we use it on everything we do. And we have already um, had one aspect of it when there were all these manner of speaking mentioned. So here it is again mentioned that there are 36 kinds of frivolous chatter and those that we had already, we heard that already. And if we have clear comprehension we would abandon those and just use suitable talk based on the ten subjects of talk. Now this is not uninteresting because people often wonder what, what should one talk about if one doesn't talk about all those things. So here are ten subjects of talk which are suitable. Wanting little, contentment, seclusion, Aloofness from sense contact, arousing energy, moral discipline, concentration, wisdom, liberation, and knowledge and vision of liberation. In other words, it's all on the Dhamma. Every bit of that talk has to do with Dhamma. Now one doesn't have to say this is the Buddha's teaching if one wants to talk to somebody about these things, but if one directs one's talk in these in this way, it will naturally fall into place towards the comprehension of trying to find the true and profound insight. So it, it all has to do with letting the world go by, not trying to be in it. Now obviously we have to be in it because of this body. We have to live in it. But we can live in it without being in it with our mind. We have to attend to our duties, certainly. But that doesn't mean that the mind has to react to all that. It does it because it needs to be done. And as you do things, because they need to be done, and for no other reason, they have no charge, none whatsoever they just get done. They're neither wonderful to do nor awful to do. They just need to be done. That's all. And they get done quickly, efficiently, and without any reaction to them. And the same goes, of course, for conversation. The Buddha mentions this conversation thing so often um, because of the fact that it's food for the mind that we need to use clear comprehension on that too. The clear comprehension of the kind of talk which is frivolous or otherwise. Yes, I've already explained that.
Now, one of the things that the talk is about, aloofness from sense contact we know about, arousing energy, moral discipline, concentration, wisdom, we know all that, liberation, knowledge and vision of that. But one of them is also about contentment. And contentment is the next step after mindfulness and clear comprehension. So contentment is another of the fruits that we have from the spiritual life. I'll just read that little paragraph as it says here, because I like you to hear how, that it is actually the Buddha's teaching, so that it is not always just the interpret, uh, interpret, interpretation, but it is actually there to be found. And how great king is a person content. One is content with robes to protect the body, arms food to sustain the belly. Wherever one goes, one sets out taking only requisite. Just as a bird, wherever it goes, flies with its wings as its only burden, in the same way one is content with robes to protect the body, arms food to sustain the belly. Wherever one goes, one sets out taking only the requisites along. In this way, the person is content. So what the Buddha is saying here is a result or a fruit of the spiritual life is the lack of uh, possession. The less possessions one has, the easier it is. The more possessions one has, the more there is to be looked uh, after one has to worry about it, one has to pay for it, one has to insure it, one has to clean it, one has to replace it, one has to mend it, one has to fix it, one has to carry it. It is uh, a great burden. Imagine you go on a journey. I'm sure everybody's been on a journey. And most people have huge suitcases. And they're really heavy. You only have a little bag. It's much easier. Well, this life that we're living is a journey from birth to death. And the less we carry around, the easier it is. And that is, here the talk is about material possession. But the less we carry around of rejections and resistances, viewpoints, the less we carry around of our own opinions, the less we carry around of dislikes, the easier the journey is. It's a journey which is all we've got, isn't it? That's all we have. Whether there's going to be a future journey or not, who knows? And do you really care? The one thing that matters is this one, isn't it? And whether we had one before or not, who cares? It's all gone, isn't it? This is the one journey we have. And nowadays, when one can fly so easily around the globe, it's so easy to know this is a journey. But in this journey from birth to death, while we can fly around the globe, while we can move from one country to another or from one city to another, we're stuck with one thing always. We're stuck with our inner being, which may or may not facilitate this journey. If it's lightweight, elevated, doesn't carry much around with it, the journey is easy. But if there's a lot of heavy stuff which prevents one from concentration, which prevents one from feeling at ease, having a well-being, a lot of this heavy stuff the journey is very difficult. Just like going on a journey with huge suitcases full of things and hardly carry them. So this is one of the things. Now the contentment that the Buddha talks about and he speaks about it quite often is a state of mind, naturally. Absolutely essential for meditation. 
And if anything in particular disturbs the meditation, that too wouldn't matter if there is not the wanting to get rid of it. If one accepts it and is content with the way things are. The way things are, that's the way they are. What an absurd truism. And yet, most people have terrible difficulties with it. They, practically everybody wants things otherwise. They don't want to have a pain in the body. They don't want to have a pain in the mind. So who promised that there wasn't going to be any pain in the body or any pain in the mind? It becomes twice as painful. No, it becomes ten times as painful when it's supposed to be not there. As long as it's all right to be there, so it is. Things are the way they are. Contentment. Contentment with what we've got. Maybe we have a picture in mind how we should be. Young, beautiful, rich, clever, beloved, appreciated, famous, what else? Anybody got all that? So, we're going to be content with what we've got. Whatever it is. It doesn't matter. That's the way it is. If that contentment isn't there, Meditation isn't there. Here, the Buddha speaks about the contentment with few things. Being contented with just the bare minimum. In our society, it's almost impossible to have that bare a minimum as the Buddha had. I think Gandhi did that. If I remember right, he tried very hard to really have only the minimum. But what we do have to look out for is the contentment in the mind. With whatever there is, that's it. That is fine. Whether we are young, beautiful, rich, clever, without any pains whatsoever or not, what does it matter? That's what is. If we stop resisting, if we stop pushing against that what there is, we can let go and relax. And that what there is is no longer a pain. It just is. Contentment is probably one of the most important mind states in order to start meditation. Once we get into con concentrated meditation, contentment arises. It's the beginning of the third jhana. But that too is impermanent. So contentment has to have a much deeper and profounder base so that it stays with us. But what are we contented with? Seeing that there is Dukkha and recognizing that this path can lead us out of it completely, irrevocably, forever. There's only one thing that's not impermanent, and that's Nibbana. Seeing that, that there is Dukkha, but not pushing against it, not trying to get rid of it, but just seeing it, and then comes the understanding, there is a way, this practice, and then the practice becomes the joy. And with that, there's contentment. I found a way. 
and this way will lead me out. Whether I've got there already or not doesn't matter at all. Because when I've got there already, I don't have to be told about contentment. Then you've got it. Not trying to make the worldly life okay. It never will be. This body is by its own nature already against contentment. It has its moments, as we all know, but just moments. This body can never be fully satisfied. And the mind, by its own nature, because of the thinking process, can never be fully satisfied. It has its moments. That's all. So to try to make the body and or the mind in the worldly sense to put be satisfying so that we can be in a contented within is impossible. There's no way that's ever going to happen. The older the body gets, the more troubles it has. And young bodies have, seem to have as much trouble as the old bodies, it seems. But to get past and transcend the world, that is what the Buddha taught. That doesn't mean that we now disappear from this world. We will when we die. But the transcending of the worldly conditions brings with it that inner contentment. Even the knowing and the accepting of the fact that there is such a thing as transcending the worldly conditions, that already brings contentment. That contentment is necessary in order to meditate properly. All the things that we have heard about, and there's one more, are only leading up to meditation. The Buddha hasn't said a word yet about meditation. It starts with the meditation day after tomorrow. <laughs> so we have come to one of the important aspects of the um, mind state which we need. See, most people, of course, they meditate in order so that they can become contented. But once you do get it, you realize that too is impermanent. So we have to find within that understanding. Now that understanding comes if we use clear comprehension, the method, and then from that the result of the method, namely seeing that within all this changing phenomena, that constant flux and flow, within all the unsatisfactoriness which exists in body and mind, it's impossible to find complete and total contentment. So, with that understanding, as one's faith, one knows that there's something else. And with that something else, the mind realizes it can leave all that behind. It doesn't have to worry about it. It will never be totally satisfied. Not only do we look at our past experiences in the world, that also is helpful. Why not? And see whether there's ever been complete and total satisfaction, even under the best circumstances. Check it out. It's worthwhile doing. But the other thing is that we must use those insight methods to actualize within us the profundity and depths of what the Buddha showed us. It is the only teaching that ever laid it out that clearly. Mind you, the great religions, when practiced correctly, lead to that, or can lead to that. But there's no other that has it in that clarity, in that detail, with that many possibilities of practice. All right. We have some questions. This is the time to ask them. We 
I'm just going to check for a moment whether I forgot to tell you anything. Any questions? Quite clear, everything. Wonderful. We're all going to walk out of here enlightened. Yes. Oh, really? Yeah. In Tala? In Tala, probably we keep like two streets apart now. Where is Shasta Abbey? Um, Shasta, California. Oh. So, I can, I can get you the address and get it to someone here. Oh, yes. Yes, sir. Yes. I even have a copy of it there. Oh, but not here. I can probably make it as cheap as you. Oh. <laughs> 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 so, you, you have already got the, the city <laughs> and not the no, but I, I have a <laughs> Yeah, well, that would be rather nice, I think. That would be lovely if it's not a great burden to no, do it. I can call a friend and he can give it to Anna who comes sometimes. Right. And she can do it. Right. So hopefully you can get it Oh, that would be very nice. And and uh, get the address. You know the cost of it? Well, if you if you have it here, um, I will explain it okay. because without the explanation, it's just a picture. But it, on the back of it, it does have an explanation. The whole back of the poster is. Is it? Well, I'll look at that and see if that's in, in detailed enough to understand. No, I would much prefer to your explanation because <laughs> I remember the very first course that, that I took with you, you did an explanation. Oh, did I? Um, maybe one or two thousand dollars. On there. Uh huh. Yeah. Even in those days, I did that already. Yeah. <laughs> it was very, very interesting that you didn't have a picture there. Right. 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 Okay, if we have the picture, I'll, I'll explain it. It is interesting, and it is the hub of the wheel of the Dhamma, because it is containing the Four Noble Truths, the Noble Eight Persons. It contains, well, it contains primarily the Four Noble Truths in a much greater explanation and detail. So it is very important. And the Buddha said, who understands the ten origination understands the Dhamma. Who does not understand the ten origination does not understand the Dhamma. So it is a very important teaching. Mm, that would be great. Mm-hmm. Anything else? Yes. Oh, breathing it out, letting it go. Sure, if it goes. Anything that works is fine. <laughs> sure, breathing it out, letting go of it. Yes. Well, it is um, also useful in everyday life uh, if things become tight, you know, like uh, people who have work situations which can become quite uh, stressful, to go to the breath for a few moments. Just watch the breath. Never mind what everybody else is doing. The whole world is in, in under stress. So just watch the breath for a moment or two, two minutes, and then the stress resolve, dissolves and you can go back. It's, it's, it's something like that. It's good. I didn't mention the um, parts of the body, but I've mentioned it several times already, which is another method. I'll just repeat it now to open the zipper in front and take all the bits and pieces out and see how many parts you can find. It's just in your mind you can find them. And what they feel like, what they look like, put them in front of you, look at them, look at them carefully, and then see where is the me in all that? Take all the bones nicely out and 
put them under the heat and see where's me in that and see whether there is anybody there so um, which is another aspect of the practice of the non-delusion just another way of doing it um, I have already mentioned I think the uh, steps, the insight steps that are the results of all that. But I will mention the first uh, two or three um, just to show where we're going. It is important to not only know the path, but also to know the goal or the uh, end of the path so that one keeps one's mind in the right direction. It is uh, when you drive a car and you know which road to take, but it's extremely helpful to know which town you're going to. So, um, so that you don't lose your way on the way. Some of that is often misunderstood. Um, the first aspect of insight is that mind and body are two. And especially in the walking meditation, also in the watching of the breath, this can be noticed quite clearly because the body breathes and the mind knows it. It's impossible for the body to know it and for the mind to breathe. And it's the same in walking meditation where one can become aware and should become aware as another aspect of non-delusion of the fact that the mind has the intention of the walking and then the body walks so watch that intention walking intention walking intention standing still to know that there are two is absolutely essential because of the fact that we then realize whatever we're doing we're doing in the mind and not just to accept it but to actually know it from their own experience and then, as a second step for insight, is this what we've discussed so many times already, the impermanence, that what arises has to cease. And as it arises and ceases, we can see that in the breath, rising and ceasing, we can see it in the walking, every movement has to arise and cease. Otherwise, if it doesn't, we're stuck. We used to play this as kids and you run around and then somebody um, uh, blows a whistle and you have to stand still in that position where you were and then the, the one that looked the funniest was the winner <laughs> practicing non, non, non-impermanence <laughs> so our body would be like that if we didn't have impermanence of movement we would be stuck in one position no? but the arising and ceasing also of the observer who observes all that now the observer seems to be there all the time but actually it's a movement in the mind now becoming aware of that movement it's a mental formation observer is a mental formation so it's very important to notice how that too is moving and then sometimes there's no awareness of the whole thing but otherwise when there is awareness of the observer that observer itself has also movement in it now when we realize the movement in the mind then we realize the dukkha of the thinking well easily easily, um, recognized is the impermanence of the sense contact I mean that's very simple because they're constantly changing but also while the same sense contact is going on that it isn't a solidity in it it's um, it's a heap of almost like impulses I should say it's a heap of impulses each sense contact is a, is, is a heap of an impulse where there are different impulses coming all the time. Now this is very important as a second 
understanding a second inside base sometimes this comes in that uh, sequence sometimes it comes later um, because we can then see that the sense contact are dukkha and to that it might be important to mention that the Buddha compared our sense contacts that we have with a cow that has been skinned and the flies are constantly touching upon the raw flesh. We always think that sense contacts, if we choose them, the nice ones, that is what's going to make us happy. But in reality, if we become aware of the fact that there are a heap of impulses which are constantly having an impact upon us to which we react, we will finally see the dukkha of them. Now that is necessary to see also in order to let go of the need illusion. Sometimes one sees it before having or letting go. Sometimes we can let go of the mid delusion and then see it afterwards. Doesn't matter. Eventually one sees it. So we have as our second insight step the experience of impermanence, the rising and ceasing of the meditation subject, whether it's walking or the breath, We have the arising and ceasing of the observer who is observing that going on, because that again is a heap of impulses of the mental formation. And we have the sense contact, which we also notice in that same way. And of course the impermanence of the body, which is um, easy to see if we can, if we just look at the way we used to look, the way we look now, but also with strong mindfulness we become aware of the movement in the body as a constant movement, contract and expand. Please put the attention on the breath for just a few moments. Take a look at yourself and your life and arouse contentment in your heart for who you are and how you are, how you feel and the life you lead. Let this contentment pervade you, fill you, surround you. Be the contentment.
put your attention on the person sitting nearest you in this room. Feel totally contented with that person being near you the way he or she is and transmit that contentment to that person. Letting him or her feel how contented you are with their presence, their being. now have that feeling of contentment about everyone here. Exactly how everyone is, who everyone is. Then transmit that feeling to everyone. Contentment with everyone's presence, everyone's being. Make the heart connection with everyone. Think of your parents, whether they're still alive or not. Feel totally contented with who they are and how they are. And then transmit that feeling to them, letting them feel that contentment that you're experiencing about them. Think of those people who are very close to you, those that you may be living with, and feel totally contented with how they are, with their way of being. And let them Feel that contentment. Fill them with it. Think of all your friends. Feel utterly contented about their friendship, their connection to you. 
transmit that feeling of contentment to them, filling and surrounding them with it, letting them know. Think of your neighbors, the people you work with, people you meet often, acquaintances, relations, as that feeling of contentment about their closeness to you, about the way they are and who they are, arrive in your heart, embracing them with it, letting them feel it. Now think of the many things that exist in your life that you can be contented with. The many people that you have met here and there being contented and pleased about their connection with you. Let this contentment spread in your heart till you're completely filled with it. And then let it spill over and reach out to beings near and far, transmitting that healing, making your heart connection with as many beings as possible, wherever you can imagine them to be, whoever they are. Let that feeling of contentment embrace the globe with all its different beings on it. Let it have the strength to reach out into the universe, embracing all there is, seen or unseen, Put 
your attention back on yourself and feel the ease within that contentment brings when there's no resistance, no rejection, just acceptance and flowing and being one with whatever there is. Feel that ease and the joy that comes with it. And then let contentment fill you, surround you, drench you. Be the contentment. May beings everywhere have contentment in their heart.